You know, I was <clears throat> very taken by the testimony. One thing I will say that I took from this is this uh, concept that, you know, unfortunately I feel like uh, young people today are put in a position where they're having to make decisions at an earlier age and have more access to credit. When you have a smartphone, that becomes a obviously a banking uh, is one you know click away. Uh, gain a loan becomes one click away. Uh, you can probably sign. I don't know if this is for sure yet, but I know you can do many financial transactions over your phone. I'm not sure if you can sign your financial aid yet. It just seems that. You know, when you go to college and you sign up for all these loans and then you're going to graduate with 40, 50, 60, or even $100,000 in debt, they make you take a class uh, to kind of go over the basics of what it means to take financial responsibilities on like a student loan. Uh, we don't have that kind of requirement uh, to get out a credit card. I know in the past there were some kind of predatory practices going on with marketing credit cards to minors at theme parks, at uh, college campuses, at sporting events. It seems like that's curtailed. Do we have any evidence that we've seen uh, any abuse in that area, or has that seemingly been a problem that's been somewhat uh, managed by new regulations? Uh, from what I've seen, and you can add on too, is that um, at one time they were actually on college campuses giving out T-shirts and baseball caps or whatever credit card applications. But from what I've heard and seen, they've been removed from that avenue. You know, since this is obviously an area that you both work uh, very hard in, and seem to know a lot about. We have a next panel coming up that deals with the education side of it. Um, but in your worldview, on how you see it, what do you think it would take to make sure that kids graduating from high school, going into the real world, whether they choose to go to college or not, what do they need to be successful? Is it just one class? I took one economics class. I didn't feel like it was enough. And, and you know, is it... You know, should it start ninth grade? Should it start earlier than that? Should it be every single year? So maybe start with Tina. And, uh, and so what would you say that is? Certainly. I think it needs to start in kindergarten. I think age-appropriate financial education lessons throughout school, um, K through 12, is is imperative to be able to instill the the education and, and just to instill the knowledge that it's important to think about the decisions and, and as um, he had said earlier, to know, you don't necessarily have to know all the answers, but you have to know where to go to get the answers. Um, so I think that it needs to start very young. Okay. Thanks. James? I know we concur. Um, our curriculum that we use for Operation Home Call Banking Our Future, is t it's tiered. Um, it's differentiated for elementary, middle school, and high school. And we actually follow the kids every year on a track system, if you will. The presenters are all different. We take volunteers, in fact, come from the banking industry, accountants, CPAs. The idea is they might be learning the same material, but for the parents or maybe yourself, you know what happens during the summertime. You kind of, you kind of forget. And so by introducing it again next year with a different presenter, we hash the same topic but in a different light. And so I do believe that repetition um, is important uh, due to the fall off, but also the fact that if you, you have tiered curriculum, it gets more complex. Last example is um, in our kids' elementary level, they don't talk about W-2s or pay stubs, but they do it in high school. And so it's just the idea that they build upon coming of age, if you will, and a more practical application. My, my last thoughts would be um, we have a program right now we're doing with Wells Fargo in my district. They've taken 100 students in a college-bound program from local high schools, many of these low-income uh, first-generation students, first-generation students that will be the first in their families to go to college as well. And we've taken these 100 students, and I will tell you the growth, I, the growth I've seen these students and their aptitude and ability to understand very complicated uh, financial kind of um, coursework uh, that we've kind of kind of just thrown at them, and they've gotten very little exposure to this before. has been amazing. I'm very proud of these students. Uh, but what I've also seen is as you increase uh, their exposure to these concepts, it also, I think, has helped them in their other studies. I've talked to a number of students that said when they started to realize the importance of uh, understanding some of these concepts, it gave them more kind of a sense of why math is important. Uh, one of the students told me that he hated statistics before, uh, he started this coursework on financial literacy, but it made statistics and some of these other uh, math courses he was taking much more relevant and tangible. Uh, so I do think there's an ability to start weaving this coursework in uh, to typical curriculum and making it uh, something that when you're taking a statistics class, when you're taking science classes, when you're taking literature classes, if it has a, an opportunity for the curriculum to include financial literacy so it's kind of 
you know, woven into the fabric of the coursework already, I do think students will also benefit in other areas of their studies. I also just like to finish by saying, if you have examples of other states that are doing this already, uh, I know we talked about a number of other states in the beginning that already have this kind of recommendation or mandate in some cases uh, that they have to include this in their curriculum, uh, please get that to the Banking Finance Committee. We'd love to see some of those examples because I do think this is something that next year we'd like to move forward on. Um, the only other thing I'd, I would end so we can move on to our next panel is, you know, in terms of this were to be a curriculum change, is there already something that's put in place where you could literally say, this is, this is the format, this is the model that you should follow? Uh, because a lot of times when you deal with curriculum, I mean, obviously it's, it's not just easy to change curriculum. It's a, it's a very difficult thing to do. And there's a lot of things that go into that. Uh, but is there a model or um, kind of um, a guide to which could be referenced you know, if you say K through 12, well, is there something that exists out there that deals with that or that, 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 that at least is a framework? There are certainly states that we can look at. The three that I mentioned um, that the FINRA study looked at have, um, have a good start. They're, they have programs in place, so those are, are definitely worth looking at. I believe those are high school mm -hmm. um, programs. Um, but there are states, again, that are, that are incorporating it at younger ages as well. Okay. Agreed. And I think as long as it revolves around our common core state standards, I think it will fit right in there, too. Great. Well, I want to thank you both for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. So we're going to go ahead and bring up our next panel. Uh, this panel is Finding Solutions to Financial Literacy. We have Thomas Adams, the Executive Director, Instructional, uh, Instructional Quality Commission and Deputy Superintendent Instruction and Learning Support Branch in California Department of Education, uh, Jose Albanda. Uh, Superintendent, Sacramento City Unified School District, Kay Hubler, uh, Director, Financial Literacy Program, YMC, uh, YWCA Berkeley, and Brent Neisser, uh, Senior Director of Strategic Programs and Alliances, National Endowment for Financial Education. I want to thank you all for your time, and we're going to go ahead and start today with uh, Mr. Adams. Don't worry about it. Take your time. Good morning, I'm Tom Adams from the California Department of Education. Um, I'm here to give you a, an update on how we have uh, infused financial literacy into two frameworks, the mathematics framework <coughs> and the history social science framework. Um, this is, um, as you know, was done uh, with, because of Assembly Bill 166. We've already talked about that this morning. I don't think I really have to go over the requirements of it, but just to mention that it does, uh, uh, require us to include financial literacy and mathematics, history, social science, and the health framework. And we've been successful with mathematics and history, social science. We're just waiting to start the health framework itself. Um, in terms of financial literacy in the math framework, uh, the great thing that we did here is we actually made it an explicit um, appendix in the framework. And then what you would find is problems on uh, that are rooted in financial literacy skills all the way through the different grade levels. So you would find in there problems uh, at the kindergarten level, starting with the yard sale, all the way up to uh, later, uh, say in high school, you would deal with um, problems that around credit card debt itself. Um, the other thing I want to stress about this is the great thing is is that uh, because we adopted the, uh, the Common Core uh, standards. Uh, what they required was to actually have real-world math problems, and this is important because uh, what we want math to be seen is not simply as um, an important body of knowledge to know, but that it has application to day-to-day -to -day, uh, 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 problems and actually helping you solve them. Um, history social science, um, uh, let me just say, in the mathematics framework, we say mathematical knowledge is the first step to financial literacy. In history, social science, what we talk about really is the necessity of actually 
making sure that it's based on economic reasoning. And as you can see, that that's an important two, two sides of the coin uh, with mathematical uh, knowledge being one and then economic reasoning being the other. A good example of, say, some of the economic reasoning that you would find um, in the history of social science is just the concept of uh, cost-benefit analysis. And we have students doing that as early as third grade in the history of social science framework. Other things we do is we um, have a grade nine financial literacy elective. Um, grade nine is often seen as the year of the elective course in history social science. And then in grade 12 in the economics course, um, unlike past in the past where we've um, concentrated a lot on um, the theories of economics, here we have the actual application of uh, economics to personal life, especially in the areas of of what is a personal budget, how do you account for it based upon all your expenses, as well as the concept of, of debt being something more than just that, that it can have both a positive and negative relationship in one's life. There are certain debts that you do want to take on because they will improve your um, uh, economic profile later in life, say as a college debt, but then there are debts taken on that simply for um, consumer goods that are not necessary or might be beyond your your income at that point in life. So that's where we are right now in, in terms of um, financial literacy in the curriculum. Uh, I'm, in terms of um, the health framework, we actually hope to begin that uh, this coming fiscal year. One of the things that the health standards do have in there that I think lends itself well to financial literacy is it, uh, there's a lot of um, topics in those standards about consumer education and being an informed consumer. So in this sense, uh, we're happy to move along and infuse this important topic in the curriculum and not just one, two, but three areas. And, be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Thomas. I, I got a question. Is there anything binding with right now that that um, kind of forces the the issue of financial literacy to be placed in the curriculum? So I know there's there's standards and what you just talked about, but is there anything that says okay, this will has to be included in the curriculum by such and such date, or is it just kind of like right now we would like this to be in the curriculum? This is kind of what we we think should be, but the is it not? Um, I mean, I'm just want to know: Is it translating into the curriculum just yet? So one of the things to keep in mind, uh, both in terms of standards and curriculum in California, these are always state guidelines. They are not mandated. Uh, they become the basis for state policy and for state programs. But we cannot go into a district and say you must teach something, even our state adopted standards. Um, but what we do have is uh, the topic of financial literacy in our state adopted materials. We did have a math adoption in 2014 that did include uh, some financial literacy problems. Uh, with history social science, we will have um, instructional materials in uh, 2017. So some of those concepts, the economic concepts and the financial literacy concepts will be in those instructional materials and eventually with health as well. But what standards are and curriculum frameworks are is our way of saying to school districts here's the best way to teach in essence think of the standards as the what and the curriculum frameworks as the how when it comes to instruction great well i'm going to see if there's any other questions from members um you know i w eventually want to get to this idea of mandating on a state level for locals to do this but i'd rather hear from the locals first and then he hear their testimony and then we can get into that issue a little bit later. Um, so next we're going to move on to our next panelist, uh, Mr. Banda, Superintendent of the Sacramento City Unified School District, sir, and I want to thank you for being here. Very good. Thank you very much, co-chairs and committee members. Um, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this hearing today, and I'm here to provide some examples of what uh, Sac City in particular uh, is doing to provide financial literacy for our students. We know financial literacy is a vital competency that aligns with our district's mission to prepare our students fully for college, career, and for life. Especially true for students in high poverty neighborhoods where there are more checking, check cashing facilities than there are savings banks. 
and where used car sales lots dangle these great deals at double-digit interest rates. Many of our families lost their homes during the mortgage crisis. Many of our parents lost their life savings with the financial collapse. So it's imperative that we help this next generation avoid the pitfalls of the past. We're working to help our teens navigate these complex issues through a variety of strategies. The best opportunity uh, is through our 12th grade economics course, which is, which is a graduation requirement. Currently, many of our econ teachers are using a program that's called EverFi. Uh, EverFi is a technology-based program that is provided free from U.S. Bank. It engages students in a series of modules focused on building their knowledge, their skill, and their capacity in several areas such as savings, college costs, investing, credit scores, and renting versus owning. There's also a module that walks students step-by-step -step through their FAFSA, which is their uh, financial aid application. Another one demonstrates the tax structure by taking students to various components of a pay stub, which was mentioned earlier in one of the others uh, by the speakers. Students can also explore whether or not they can afford the car of their dreams by going through the steps to purchase a car. A promising program uh, that has come from, uh, another promising program has come from our partnership with Sacramento City College. One of our uh, small high schools, Health Professions High School, is piloting a course in grades 9 and 12 in partnership with the college. It's called Foundations for Success. During the course, students build a 10-year plan that includes their high school plans and post-secondary and career options. Students learn and practice the skills for goal setting, identity formation, career research, decision making, and budgeting. They learn how to secure entry-level employment as well. They can earn college credit for completion of the, of the course, and we're very excited to be able to offer this course and intend to keep working with the college, uh, colleges on ways to make it relevant, uh, as relevant as possible for all of our students. And yet another uh, promising program is the work currently underway in one of our linked learning pathways at Hiram Johnson uh, High School. It's called the Johnson Corporate and Business Academy. A linked learning pathway links the classroom to a career pathway within a specific industry sector. Pathway students participate in work-based learning um, experiences such as internships, mentorships, uh, job shadowing, and or uh, hosting guest speakers where they interact with experts in specific career field. Within the Johnson Corporate and Business Academy, students focus on entrepreneurship and careers within business and finance. Two courses anchor the pathway and provide the context for students to gain in-depth experience in both personal and business-related financial literacy. One of those is titled Business Economics and the other one's Financial Planning. Business Economics provides students with an introduction to the key concepts of economics as it pertains to businesses, supply, demand, profit, costs, and markets, and differentiates microeconomics and macroeconomics. Students discuss the American economy and the factors that influence the success of businesses and product. They explore forms of business ownership and examine the relationship of labor and businesses as well as studying global economies. Students apply what they learn, uh, have learned in the course through a culminating project, uh, forming consulting teams and vying for a long-term contract as management consultants to a major avocado grower and distributor. The financial planning course teaches uh, students about the importance of financial planning and helping people reach their goals. The course includes uh, lessons on savings, borrowing, credit, and all types of insurance. It covers various types of investments, including income and growth investments. Students also analyze retirement and estate planning. The students put their knowledge and skills to use to serve their community through the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance, or the VITA program. This is a partnership with the IRS, the California Franchise Tax Board, and the United Way that provides a tax help to low-income families. This year, Hiram Johnson uh, JCBA students prepared 150 tax returns for families and their communities. None of these are district-wide initiatives, however. Recognizing that we need every student to learn this information, we're very excited about the state's draft updates to the, the history slash social science framework which we heard about a little, uh, a little while ago. The updates tie in closely with uh, our own work to redesign our social science classes. The framework places uh, explicit emphasis on financial literacy and understanding the operation and impact of economics on a very personal level. 
We really welcome the opportunity to expand this emphasis within our current courses and offerings. Once the framework is finalized, which is scheduled for the winter of 2016, we will begin to work with our teachers through targeted professional learning and to review and update our existing courses of study as needed. Thank you, thank you Mr. Superintendent. You know, and I have a question. Well, first I want to thank you for the programs that you are working on right now to help kids get the financial education that they need. I mean, obviously, I think the goal here would be that all kids uh, throughout the state of California have access to financial literacy courses mm -hmm. on a regular basis so that by the time they leave um, uh, high school, you know, they're, they're fully prepared to, to deal with the world that they're about to enter into. Mm -hmm. um, but <clears throat> as a superintendent on the local level, mm -hmm. how would you see it as uh, in terms of the state involvement? I mean, there's obviously different things that we can do to mandate different districts to do certain things. But would you rather see us do a mandate saying you have to teach it and this is um, uh, what you should teach or do a mandate that says um, uh, financial literacy, you have to teach it, but give the locals the control to control what it is that uh, they teach? Because the goal here is – is if we leave it saying, okay, it's our goal on a local level for you all to, to develop it on your own or, or to decide whether or not you're going to do it on your own, well, then you're now creating, creating a discrepancy among different school districts because some school districts will see it as a priority while others will not see it as a priority. And, or maybe they feel like they can't do it. And so if, if that's the case, I, I feel like uh, the, the state has to step in and say, no, well, you have to teach financial literacy in, the, in your curriculum. If that, I guess the, the, the idea is, is how would that be received, at least in terms of a local, in your, in your perspective? And then should we dictate exactly what should be taught or should we leave the locals um, open to figuring out what they should be teaching? Because, again, holding to the idea of continuity uh, so that all students are learning not only the information that they need, but learning the same information so they have the same skill sets and that other students aren't being more benefited uh, across the state than others. Equity. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I would prefer the latter. You know, I think any time that things are mandated, um, there's always the question about where will it fit and, and how much time would be dedicated to it. And then often, oftentimes there's a question of cost, right? If, if it's something that's mandated that's going to require new textbooks, new trainings, new materials, where is that going to come from? And so I, I know my experiences with the state is that oftentimes things get mandated, but there's no additional supports to do it. Um, but I do think that um, having something that says this is something that's very important to, to us as, at California, not just as, as, as assembly members, but this is important to California and important to our children, important to our youth, that we include um, – some form of fiscal literacy in, in our curriculum. Um, you know, that's something that could be co-designed along with the, the State Department of Ed, along with legislators, along with folks that, that have boots on the ground, to be able to say, what would that look like? I, I do believe we have that commitment. I just know that we have to be careful as we move forward to say, where would it lie? Where will it live? And how much are we expecting it to, to, of that to be done, and where would it, where would it be the um, you know best served uh, in terms of providing that literacy for our, our students? You know, we're, we're facing issues right now looking at our, our graduation requirements. You know, there's a big push on ethnic studies, which I totally support. But when we look at that, luckily that's not mandated, but we are very much in, into that. But also knowing that. As we put that into a requirement for graduation, what's going to come off the plate? Unless we extend the school day, provide more time for instruction, add additional periods, it doesn't, it doesn't all fit. So we have to now make tough decisions about what may come off the plate or how, it can be, how can it be combined, perhaps with a global studies class or something along those lines. So I think having some, some um, uh, flexibility in terms of where, where would this reside what would it look like? How much of it would be a requirement? Are we talking about, uh, you know, um, are we talking about modules? Are we talking about, you know, a significant portion of curriculum? Perhaps an econ. That's one of the areas that we're looking at. Uh, pump up our econ. Just like we're looking at uh, ethnic studies fitting into perhaps something that exists now, but making sure that we can, you know, provide, it, provide the space for it. Yeah, no, and I, and I think that that's a good strategy to put it somewhere where it could live in, in a, within an issue area that already exists. But I mean, I, I think that you know, I, I did a, a hearing when I first started this committee, my first year, you know, talking about what 
kids need in the state of California cradle to career? What do they need to be successful? And I found that there were a bunch of different individual groups that um, individually were doing great work, but there was never a point in time where they all came together to actually put all of their ideas and thoughts together to come up with one cohesive plan. And so I think you know when it comes to this issue, Ari, we would need to figure out, okay, by the time a kid graduates high school, this is what they need to know. Now, looking at K through 12, it doesn't need to be, you know, okay, a class, a curriculum, but it is integrated into already a lesson plan where, okay, you're not having a whole class dedicated to financial literacy, but within the lesson plan of, of a class, you're learning specific things that ultimately reach this goal so that by the time, you know, it's like a build up K through 12, you know, starting kindergarten, started easy as you move through high school, it gets more difficult, more complicated information. But by the time you graduate, the idea is, is that you have the full boat of information that you need to be completely financial. Uh, financially literate. And so I think that that is a good suggestion because, I mean, I think it is the intent, uh, at least of myself and I know of the chair, to develop a piece of legislation that starts moving us in that direction. Um, I mean, we've seen other We've seen other way, uh, other attempts at, at looking at financial literacy, but we are very serious about this issue. We understand the importance, uh, and again, we thank you for your testimony uh, here at this time. Uh, we're going to move on to our next panelist, uh, Ms. Kate Hubler, Hubler uh, who is the Director of Financial Literacy Program for YWCA Berkeley. Thank you, and I think um, we just have a PowerPoint we need to load up on the computer.